I am pleased to welcome you all here on behalf of IIT Hyderabad. I would like to take this moment to extend a warm welcome to the honorable member of Niti Aayog, Government of India, Dr. V K Saraswat, our beloved director, Professor B S Murthy, respected Professor M Vidya Sagar, who is a fellow of Royal Society and a distinguished professor at IIT Hyderabad. and our esteemed faculty members and my dear friends welcome to this event without further ado let's let's start this event with a huge round of applause oh okay sorry <laughs> So don't miss that. He is a part of us. <laughs> sure. Exactly. We are honored to have you here, sir. Thank you. And it is not today. It is not today. It is in 2040. Oh, nice. Now I would request Dr. Saraswat, Professor Murthy, and Professor Vidya Sagar sir to please join us on the dais. Please come forward and join the join the seats on the stage. Let's now welcome the man who doesn't need any introduction and very known among all of us, among all of us, because of his wisdom and his knowledge. None other than the honourable member of Niti Aayog, Dr. V K Saraswat. I would request the director of IIT Hyderabad, Professor Murthy, to kindly welcome uh, the doc welcome Dr. Saraswat with bouquet of flowers. <laughs> Now I would request Professor Kirti Chandra Shahu to felicitate our director Sir and Vidya Sagar Sir. We are part of the family, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. Uh, now I would request Professor Murthy to deliver welcome address. Thank you. We are already late by twenty-five minutes, so I don't want to take much time. We are eagerly waiting to hear from Saraswat Ji, and who is so close to us and. Uh, phenomenal uh, work. that he has done in the particularly in the area of uh, defense you are all uh, aware of his contributions to the missile program of uh, the country and uh, today we are happy that he is here to launch a very uh, i would say um, important milestone in the uh, not just iit hyderabad uh, you know uh, but also i would say for the whole country it's going to be a wonderful contribution that it's going to happen is a facility that kirti is setting up uh, which is going to uh, talk about the dynamics of rain drop uh, at various altitudes uh, uh, and uh, provide information from that uh, on how to predict the rainfall in the whole country in various regions so that's going to be an enormous uh, i would say uh, step forward uh, in the in the field of weather forecast and rain forecast and i'm very happy that we are taking lead iit hyderabad has been taking lead in various aspects this is another one more feather in the camp of iit hyderabad thanks to kirti's hard work uh, that this facility is going to be set up at iit hyderabad and dr saraswat has actually been invited to inaugurate that particular facility and i am sure that this facility will be uh, immensely useful for the country i am looking forward to great results coming out of that so with those few words once again welcome all of you and welcome sir uh, for coming he always loves to come to iit hyderabad and and i'm sure he would have seen some changes uh, from the last visit to this visit so iit hyderabad has been growing a lot uh, so so with these few words thank you very much for this opportunity and uh, 
we look forward to listening to our wonderful talks from Dr. Saraswati. Thank you, sir, for such such a kind words. Now I would request Professor Vidya Sagar, sir, to uh, invite and introduce our honorable speaker. Yeah, thank you very much. So I have a, an official biography of Dr. Sagar, sir. But you don't need that. Yeah, I don't, I was going to say exactly that. Uh, since I've known each other for about 25 plus years, I don't really need the official biography, but I'll take a few uh, snippets from here. So he was born on 25th May 1949 in Gwalior and finished his bachelor's from Madhav Institute of Technology and Science in Gwalior, master's from Institute of Science and PhD for, uh, in propulsion engineering from University. Now I knew Dr. Saraswar, uh, First time in 1987, I was spending a year in Hyderabad uh, visiting um, a DRDO. At that point, Dr. Abdul Kalam was the director of that lab. And they had recently started what they call the IGMDP, Integrated Guided Missile Development Program. And there were five missiles under that. One of them was Prithvi. And at that point, uh, General Sundaram was the project director, and Dr. Saraswat was uh, uh, number two in the hierarchy. And after General Sundaram retired, Dr. Saraswat became the project director. And I was very fortunate that during the year I was spending in DRDL, we had the first successful launch of the Prudhvi missile in February of 1988. So that was uh, considered as a huge milestone. Uh, you cannot imagine what an emotional and uh, lift it was for the uh, people of India. So then subsequently, uh, he was also involved in the development of uh, a vehicle called Laksha. Laksha you know, means target. So it was a, for uh, uh, training our missile, so to speak. And also a Nishan, which is night vision and Rustam. Uh, he rose through the ranks of uh, the DRDO and eventually served as the Director General of uh, DRDO. And then after uh, retiring from that, he has become the member science of the Niti Aayog, which as we all know, uh, was the successor of the old planning commission. He has received several awards, and I'll just read a few of them. Arjapata Award, uh, National Academy of Engineering, Fellow of National Academy of Engineering, Aeronautical Society of India, Astronautical Society of India, and the Institution of Engineers. Uh, he is, uh, the Chancellor of Jawaharlal Nehru University and President of the Chitra Tirunal Institute for Medical Sciences and Technology in Tiruvannantapuram. And uh, he is a member of the Governing Council of Samir and member of, board, uh, bo member of the Board for Research of AICT, CSIR Labs, and a Board of Studies at Usmania University. Uh, he has been uh, uh, conferred over the years with both the Padma Padma. Bush, Padma Shri and the Padma Bhushan from the government of India. So with all these two words, uh, I welcome uh, Dr. Saraswat to address all of us. I think you, you have to point out. We'll move on the other side. Yeah. Yeah, you, 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 the stage is all yours, sir. Please come. So a formal good morning and namaskar. Uh, it's always a pleasure to come to IIT Hyderabad and interact with all of you. It has been, I think, a year plus or two years now since I came. I think it was during COVID. The heart has always been part of this institution because in 2013, when I retired, I wanted a place to start continue my research and IIT Hyderabad gave me the shelter, and I am always thankful for that. So having worked between 2013 and 2015, January, almost one and a half years, uh, it has been good experience. And uh, I actually is, is started uh, telling IIT Hyderabad faculty as well as the students about the importance of doing research related to the defense. 
And uh, just now, Dr. Murthy was mentioning that you have already signed a center of excellence for defense related research activities uh, and uh, between DRDO and, uh, and IIT Hyderabad. So that means uh, the kind of seed which was uh, uh, done at the time, so that in 2014, is now going to take some major shape. Today's talk, uh, Dr. Murthy and Professor Vidya Sagar, whom I would like to greet, and all the dear students, is all about artificial intelligence, which is going to now change the spectrum of the warfare in terms of using drones, unmanned aerial systems, and other emerging technologies which are for the future warfare. But what is happening between Russia and Ukraine today? Russia and Ukraine, the face-to-face -face warfare is practically nil. What is happening is non-contact warfare using the missiles, uh, aircrafts, UAVs, unmanned systems, and so on. Of course, they have some capture in the territory using the armored and the artillery, but that's on the minimum scale. And even the human damages which are taking place are due to the kills which are being inflicted by the missiles and the bombs. In this game, artificial intelligence becomes very important. For this crowd, I don't need to actually give an impression of what is artificial intelligence, but for the sake of some problems not changing. Uh, yeah. So uh, I just want to start with the fact that how many technologies which are going to actually make a major difference in the warfare. Among them is the artificial intelligence and uh, the new advanced defense equipments, which are basically based upon hypersonic speeds and the directed energy weapons, which are going to take a major place in the warfare. All of them will be assisted by the technologies of robotics and autonomous systems, which all of you are now reading, practicing, some of you. And like the Internet of Things, there is a terminology which has been coined by the military experts. It is called Internet of Military Things, which is also going to use the network of networks and communication, military intelligence as part of the whole system. All of you are aware of the fact that the moment you have the digital domain, cyber domain becomes very predominant and cyber warfare becomes the fourth arm of as far as the warfare is concerned. We have land, sea and uh, air and the fourth arm is space and cyber warfare is the integral part of that. The immersive technologies which are being used today becomes very important like the VR, the AR for training as well as for the other applications in the decision making process. The manufacturing systems are also going to be modified Conventional manufacturing is giving way to additive manufacturing. And all this will be supported today by big data analytics because AI and big data analytics are completely interlinked. The communication networks are also becoming more efficient and can handle large data in terms of 5G and incoming 6G infrastructure. Wireless uh, electric charging systems are uh, taking shape. And for the logistics and the military data protection blockchain, and blockchain process management. So these about 10 technologies which are actually going to be all pervasive as far as the armed weapon systems are concerned. Just for the sake of completeness and to give a sense how the AI will be utilized in the, uh, in the, armed, uh, in the warfare. Artificial intelligence, which is basically defined as the multiple technologies that can be combined to sense, think and act. Sensing is referring to the pattern recognition, machine learning, perception, speech recognition, and so on. Thinking is referring to the natural language processing, knowledge representation, uh, machine learning, deep learning, and act refers to the search engines and questions, automated planning, scheduling, autonomic computing, and autonomous systems. All of you know, you must be reading in your classes today. This is just for the sake of completeness. What are the various elements of the AI? Uh, the main element is machine learning which encompasses deep learning and predictive analysis. The natural language processing consists of translation, classification, clustering, and information extraction. A speech, all of you, maybe a lot of research is going on. Triple IT, when I gave a lecture last time, there was a major uh, talk on the speech recognition, speech to text, text-free speech. In Hyderabad, actually, there's one area where a lot of work is going on. 
Expert systems is a very important thing. This is not even today. Even when Dr. Vidyasagar was with us in 1987 and later as a director of care, one of the major focus was on development of expert systems. And in those days, AI was not so much predominant, but it was basically using the conventional techniques. But neural networks had come by that time, and they were being practiced. The, reduct, the planning, scheduling, and optimization, which is a major requirement for any armed forces system, will consist of reduction of data, classical, probabilistic approach, and temporal uh, behavior identification. Robotics will consist of reactive machines and limited memory, theory of mind, and self-awareness. Vision, of course, will be part of the image recognition and machine vision, and uh, all this will become part of the warfare systems. Now, artificial intelligence has a potential to enhance the future combat skills. This is what are the various areas in which the combat skills will be enhanced. For example, an AI-enabled target recognition capability across all the three disciplines like naval air and will certainly get enhanced. Unmanned combat air vehicles, and I think one of the one of the major areas where you gentlemen and girls are going to work on that in, uh, in, 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 in uh, IIT uh, on the UAVs and the UAS systems. AI enabled deep analysis for integrated warfare threats. Threat evaluation in the case of warfare is a very important part. And AI will make, certainly make this whole process much more efficient and much more reliable. Cyber security and cyber warfare will be dictated by that. Robotic battlefield, battlefields will happen. Already we are talking of some of UAVs, some of uh, unmanned uh, land systems and so on. The simulation, uh, war simulation is a major exercise. I remember our major group used to be there in uh, DRDL where used to do war gaming and war simulation. That all already they have started using the modern techniques for the uh, AI related and machine learning related systems. AI based war games are evolving today. And for the training of the forces, AI based war games are going to be of great importance. Predictive and sequential analysis of threats and situations that will be, that is already being practiced now, but in a small measure. And the way the AI is evolving today, open inter, uh, AI operations are helping them. AI-based guided and loitering missile systems and AI-based autonomous weapon systems. So these are all going to be part of the system. Now, there are three areas or four areas, as I said, the land, sea, air, and space in the battle network. And uh, there are uh, elements there, the sensors are there, the com command control and communication and intelligence system is there. The effects which each one of them are causing is there. And there's a separate wing, which is important for any army, is the logistics. So if you see sensors, sensors uh, led in robotic ground vehicles are, are becoming part of the armed forces. Similarly, in the case of sea, long endurance autonomous surveillance systems are coming. In the case of air, you have sensing distributed uh, unmanned wingmen, which are there in the space. And space is AI enhanced situational awareness, which is coming. Cyber is AI enabled monitoring and uh, try that is coming. Command control and communication certainly is getting enhanced by the autonomous AI processing systems, cooperative human machine interface and so on. The effects are basically in terms of armored ground vehicles, intelligent uh, non-kinetic engagements that will happen. In the case of C, it will be autonomous swarms of small robotic platforms which will be operational. And there'll be systems to counter UAVs and surface swarms in the case of sea. Similarly, in the case of air, a tri-table wingman capable of conducting air-to-air -air combat. That is what we have air-to-air -air today. We have got uh, missiles which are launched from one aircraft against another aircraft. There'll be similar things in autonomous mode. Same thing will happen in the case of uh, space where autonomous anti-satellite countermeasures will be used. You know, India also launched Shakti, where we were able to um, uh, destroy a satellite uh, at, at, in, the, in the lower orbit. AI enabled cyber warfare and cyber both offense and defense is becoming going to become the major, most problematic thing to happen because it is a double-edged weapon. On the one hand, you can create better facilities for defense, but the same thing will be applied by the hackers and the uh, gamers, and the AI will become more and more difficult. 
as I mentioned to you through the blockchain, the autonomous support systems for logistics and physical delivery, for example, giving training and things like that will also be part of that. Now, human machine collaboration combat teaming. There are five pillars and I think these have to be practiced by you when you really interact with Giardo. One of them is autonomous deep learning machine system, which are able to see the patterns through the chaff of hybrid warfare. Hybrid warfare is one in which you have got sociological problems, political problems, you have problems of cyber, and you have problems of different things, in addition to what is the normal warfare which is taking place. So, which is through in that chaff, you should be able to give early warning that something is happening in the gray zone, which is called the conflict area. It's not just to identify where the enemy is. It is the entire environment you are able to scan through that. It is one of the things which are able to respond to an extreme speed. The time is essence in this case, under rapidly shrinking engagement windows. And uh, so the, the, that enabling will take place. And such learning system might fill the gap in those fields such as air defense or cyber defense. You know, cyber defense could be very, very tricky. The other day, there was a hacker attack in which within seconds, few lakhs of rupees were just transferred from one bank account to another account. Nobody could even find out. By the time they found out, already the diff is done. So the speed is the essence of the matter. Human machine collaboration, which will include the promotion of the center war fighting. That is where human and machine will work together to increase the efficiency. Teams combining the strategic analysis of a human with the tactical acuity of a computer. Human and computer will work together. Reliability defeat the human only or computer only game which the enemy may employ. Similarly, as there'll be assisted human operations where wearable electronics, unloadable combat apps, head up displays, exoskeletons and other systems can enable humans on the front line to perform better combat. Similarly, there'll be advanced human machine combat teaming where a human working with unmanned system is able to take better decisions and undertake cooperative operations. Mind it, when the C4I system started, I think Dr. Um, Vidya Sagar will remember in the days when we were talking of, when you were the care, in charge of care, we used to talk of C4I, C4I SR and all that, with a kind of command control communication network, which was where the computers started coming to assist along with the communication networks, the entire process of decision making. Now this process will get further augmented with the kind of artificial intelligence and AR and VR kind of technologies which are going to be in introduced in that. That's why human machine combat teaming will take place. There's an example of this Army Apache and Grey Eagle UAV system which are designed to operate in conjunction. They are working together. Other examples are motherships, where electronic warfare networks or swarming systems which will help transform operations by enabling one mission commander to direct a full swarm or a micro UAV system. Of course, there'll be network enabled semi-autonomous weapon systems which will be there. Now, for this, if you take a typical uh, system which will be working today, which will be combined with soldiers, command centers, drones and sensors, as you can see on this. Uh, there'll be 5G tower for the you know, cellular communication, and there'll be other uh, modes of communication, peer-to-peer, -peer, powered by artificial intelligence and IoT. It promises a battlefield benefit, such as areas are UAV and targeting, situational awareness, soldier health, how they are doing and monitoring, and critical applications. Major problem in this case is the data. Unless we are able to manage the data coming from all these sensors, bring it to the command center, which has been brought there through the 5G and other networks, uh, assuming that you have a lot of information in the cloud also, which you are able to take from there and communicate based on that to the drones and the sensors on the drones, which are doing both the functions, action as well as sensing functions. So that becomes a major task of managing to and fro data. And that means communication challenges. For this, the enablers are there. What we call the military intelligence, military, military intelligence, and how the digital systems will be implemented. One of them is called enabler. Three things are there, as I mentioned to you, connectivity of the various nodes, 
then processing power and technologies for doing that. These are the enablers what we have. The digital enablers will be for connectivity like uh, big data, AR, v, uh, digital, uh, AR, VR, and cloud. For harnessing the data, IoT, ALVL will be actionable intelligence. And for analytics, we will have processing of the data there. And all the recipients will be those which are part of the scheme, the infrastructure, which is there, like the radars, the communication system, the command center, hardwares, which are the computers and so on, sensors like radars and electro-optical systems and all that, computers which are doing analysis, and of course, there'll be human decision makers and the machine decision makers. All of them will be part of that. But all this is actually becoming a problem today because we are in the transition mode. So there are disablers today. The disablers are regulations and ethics. When we apply AI, it becomes a major problem. AI can be, a, again, twist, as I mentioned in the case of uh, cyber, it is a double-edged sword. The trust. Do you believe the decision which is coming out of the AI-driven algorithm? How much trust you can put in that? And that is where the new concept which is emerging today is explainable AI. Of course, we have for the civilian sector what we call as the responsible AI. But explainable AI is the most important thing when you get into the warfare. Same thing will happen in terms of accountability. So these are some of the disablers, but these disablers can be overcome technologically as well as through a policy measure. Both of them can be done. Now, there, there, there are, for example, fighter jets will soon use improved AI to control nearby drone wingmen able to carry weapons, test enemy air defenses. And the four functions they can do is highly supportable aircraft, which, which are completely, uh, all the things are there, like on condition, maintenance, support, all that. Training systems, what are there? Support system, sustainable engineering with 24 by 7, electronic joint service, technical data processing, and autonomic logistics and information system. All are becoming part of the aircraft today. The typical example of this, I am quoting it from the American literature, that is the Taranis BAE system drone, which uses a program flight path to reach a pre-selected area. It has been, for example, if, like we did in the case of when we went to Pakistan across, Instead of sending Mirage or, or whatever aircraft we send, we could have sent a completely autonomous drone kind of a system, carrying a bomb or a missile or a rocket and do the same damage. This is what this uh, system is doing. Pre-selected area automatically identifies and targets the threat within that search area, sends data back to its home base, where the information is verified by the human operator. It is not just that no human is there. And human OKs attack and remote pilot essentially pulls the trigger and Taranis fires before flying back to the base of its own. So this is actually presently a prototype and the missiles will be integrated later. AI for cyber security is a very important element as I mentioned to you. It can be for threat hunting. Machine learning and AI will be the base for this. It can also use the expert systems for doing the decision. But it is most important thing where AI will be used is the behavior modeling. If I have a network, whether it is a civil network or a military network, if I'm able to model the behavior of that network and that behavior I use for intrusion detection based upon any outliers or any changes, I think that becomes very important. Second thing becomes based upon this behavior, the algorithms will get self-organizing. That is becoming a part importance. So AI is kind of intelligence demonstrated at machines. And cyber security powered with artificial intelligence can boost transparency levels of the cyber playing field. Now in the cyber, what are the areas? I don't know how many of you are working in the cyber security area, but for some of us who have spent some time in this, the number of applications are like spam filter, network intrusion detection and prevention, fraud detection, and botnet detection, secure using the uh, user uh, authentication, like you use a password, but that's not enough. Cyber security ratings you can provide to the network, and you can also forecast the hacking incidents using this manifold. Now, another thing which is happening in the uh, field is the 5G, 6G. The 5G, 6G communication network will push the military communication extremely. What we are today, we were doing once upon a time using the networks on the ground. 
then it became cellular. Now 5G is becoming major. Uh, they are called network assisted device collaboration is coming. Multi hop network is coming and full duplex now. Earlier used to be only one side. Now it is full duplex. Integration of communication and sensing. Earlier sensors were separate communication. So this is happening. Uh, MLAL and a proactive network will be there. Integration of non-terrestrial networks and even higher frequencies because you are operating in 5G, you can go to 140 gigahertz uh, to terahertz domain. That means you will have much larger bandwidths available. You can set up on-demand on mobile base stations and uh, you can provide positioning information to the centimeter level and you can cover the entire area. Many of the technologies which are becoming like the backscatter communication, uh, distributed computing systems, all will happen. All those technologies can be used in military communication. ALML is used for commercial 5G, 6G network to maximize the performance of the heterogeneous 4G, 5G, 6G network. In the heterogeneous military network, the optimized performance can be good because it provides a much better jamming resistance also. Artificial neural networks, MLDL in signal processing will enable change from static to performance in the dynamic mode in a big way. So that means you can do a fairly large bandwidth operations. Then you have information coding, channel equalizer, modulator, demodulator, MIMOs, error correction interface, all this is becoming part. So the various tenets of better jamming resistance, how this is coming is because of the sped spectrum communication, jitter everywhere, FS synchronization, static to dynamic, dynamic to more frequencies available, as I mentioned to you in crisis, take benefit of the ANN and the MLDL in signal processing, redundancy of communication systems and use frequency, larger frequency bands. Take benefit of software defined radios, cognitive radio technologies, update constantly the performance of the waveform. You know, in the, in the SDR, the whole magic lies in the waveform selection. If you have a dynamic waveform forming system, your SDR will be in a position to hoodwink any of the jamming problems. So waveform during the life cycle of the radio and the waveform form, that can be done. Now I want to talk to you about drones. All of you are working on drones. I know there are uh, drones flown by IIT boys and girls. Uh, but drones are today multiple applications. All of you know that military use is very important. Inspection of power lines, forests, homeland, crowd monitoring, a variety of things. But military applications, drones are for strike missions where complete chain, finding, fixing, tracking, target, engaging, and killing. The entire chain is done. Combat research, uh, search, it can be done. Network nodes for communication, they can act as a network node. You can have different club. They can also provide intelligence, surveillance, and situational awareness. It can be used for electronic warfare. You can have jammers on board and things like that. Suppression and detection of enemy air defense, that can be also done by the drones. But the efficiency of the drones will depend upon what are the type of sensors, advanced software, unmanned combat air vehicles, in addition to including the warheads. For example, you have GPS, accelerometers, and gyroscopes. You have video IR cameras for surveillance, satellite antenna for communication, radars for detection of moving objects for, of autonomous operation, and of course, warhead for carrying out the damage to the areas identified. So there are five, six areas of research, which I think many of us have to, those who are in this field have to work on. One is smart UAV remote sensing payload. Payloads what we are having today are not smart. We have to make them smart. Like we are doing in the case of Internet of Things, through the edge computing, making the sensors more and more smart today. We should do remote sensing payloads, autonomous detection, identification and traffic objects, and identifying the distributed features. Robotics should be part of the UAV payloads for deployment and recovery. Multiple vehicle networking should be possible using the mobile sensor networks. It should be fault tolerant and robust UAV navigation system. The, one of the most important thing about, uh, about the UAV or any unmanned system is the navigation. If the navigation is impaired, then you are in difficulty. It has to be fault tolerant and things like that.
another one is smart payload for autonomous detection and tracking where we can we would like to reduce the need for high capacity payload data link today what you do have a, you have a payload you collect the information then there's a down link you send it on the ground ground processing all this should not be there you should analyze on board intelligence and take autonomous decisions real time on board machine vision machine planning for such based on optimization and distributed features such as the drones are used for oil spills you know uh, and, and uh, see eyes where it is so and most important thing it should have the capability to be inter integrated with the entire system i'm going to talk about it also fault tolerant and the robust uav navigation research is needed to provide accurate redundant and robust low cost global navigation solutions when gps and compass fails all of us are very happy we can provide it using the gps but no when it fails and you know gps uh, spoofing is very easy so automatic air speed sensor fault detection and diagnosis camera based odometry and optical flow as an alternative to magnetometer these are the sensors to be included image based navigation maps based inertial navigation system for navigating aiding north seeking and dead reckoning an accurate and reliable local navigation for precision attacks like camera inertial laser lidar radar real time kinetic uh, dgps moving baseline or autonomous launch recovery tracking docking pickup delivery these are some of the features which are required ship requires a specific thing ship based operations in remote and harsh conditions for launching and recovery of fixed wing uavs from the moving ships that is another one and identification with ship and air surveillance system using automatic identification system air defense ship and marine uh, surface ship for situational awareness so small uavs in flight uh, in flight anti icing and de icing systems wherever icing is important long distance radio communication networks are also needed here now what is the status of autonomy where it is going autonomy is not that all the auto, everything is becoming 100% autonomous the autonomy has challenges of science and technology which we discussed some of them like ai and cognitive and computer science data analytics machine human learning guidance control navigation today we are able to do what is called uh, air collision avoidance this much has happened then cells have been made now what is happening is we are also going into machine assisted operations compressing the kill chain where defensive system manager identifies threats and recommends action intelligence analytics system fuses intelligence data and queues analysis for threats future will be where the air to air and air to defense systems will be utilized where optimized platform operations delivering integrated isr and weapon effects the entire thing will be integrated and this is expected that through the ai and high speed computing we will be able to achieve this road by 2030 the new concepts for large and medium uavs are emerging today one of them is moving beyond traditional surveillance and kinetic strike roles we are also going for long endurance mission requiring high efficiency engine technology some of you must have read today's newspaper we have we are signing an agreement with us to get the predator the reaper the high altitude long endurance uav why we are looking for that that is because we need in our armed system also in flight automated refueling will be key for the expanding us system if you are going to be there for months then you need refueling may include isr functions beyond traditional electro optical surveillance line of sight may allow operation in contested or denied non permissive areas electronic warfare by stand in jamming wide area airborne surveillance is increasingly important and directed energy strike capability is likely to grow means uav is going to carry a directed energy weapon i should be able to uh, send the uh, laser beam and kill that basically conceptually if you see in a drone the three things the ai can do one is perception learning and motion which is part of the entire operation which will be used for motion planning machine perception and computer vision will be used for providing the data uh, using the machine learning and the deep learning processes to add to, uh, to to support the learning process 
Perception created through AI and we have the machine perception and the motion planning created by the AI will give you the motion planning system. So that is how it is becoming part of the overall scenario. Now, this is becoming what is called complex adaptive system of system. It is not just to me, just one UAV instance. It is going to be in the environment with perception, navigation, planning, behavior, targeting, doing the things, using the, all the other things which I mentioned, which started robotics, natural language processing, multi-agent systems, internet of things, internal sensors, external sensors, social network data coming, heuristic approach for planning, all of them uh, are becoming part of this system of a system. And ultimately, with the, uh, with the requirement that you should be able to target and response should be uh, fastest using the expert system and payload should be used for doing the damage. So this is a very complex system. In fact, one, one, uh, one of my students has done a PhD thesis on this complete thing from Dadapur University for the entire system of system using the UAVs. Drone sounds for the future warfare is becoming the reality, where you will have drones released from adapted tube on a fighter jet. Then it will slow down by a parachute. Wings will unfold as it is shown here, and it will have autonomous flight begins. Then it coordinates with other drones to fly as a swarm, where there will be a collective decision making, adaptive formation, they can change the formations, self-adjusting to changes capable of low altitude reconnaissance and so on. The size becomes very important. That's why these are very uh, using the batteries and carbon fiber and low drag fiber glass and very small sizes are used. Mostly made from commercially available components. You guys are also assembling all your drones from commercially available components. 3D printed parts you are also doing today not designed for recovery after mission, such which are not designed for that. Of course, there's a lot of advantage when you use uh, swarm drones, greater survivability, cheaper options, effectively beats the legacy air defense systems. The moment you have drawn the legacy air defense rockets and all that become very less efficient. Disruptive effect against ground-based weapon systems and limited effect of terrain. These are some of the advantages by the swarm drones. This is a typical thing which uh, we have recommended DRDO to develop. And I think one of the, one of the um, projects which you should take under this umbrella is the launching of the drone from a rocket. And then pro it should have a propeller and wings should unfurl, number two. Then expendable drone ready for mission. It should be able to go. And it should be very small. It should have folded wings. It should have a pushing propeller. Then it should be able to up to about 30 fully autonomous drones work together to benefit different targets. I think this project should be done by IIT. Design and simulation at least we can do. Manufacturing can be done by DRDO. And uh, this will be very, very good. The, this is already being done by Israel. The dimensions which I have quoted here are from an Israel uh, project which is already uh, on the way. The, Swarm concept is an effort to create a hard to detect surveillance drone. Drones, when they go, they are doing surveillance. For example, Pakistan keeps on sending lots of UAVs across our border just to find out what is happening. That will operate with little or no direct human supervision in out of the way and adverse environments. So scientists have turned to flying creatures long ago, examining their perfect conditions for flight which have evolved over millions of years. I think similar technologies will be done by mimicking the nature. Another thing which is emerging is the bionic drones. Mobile robots that can use Wi-Fi signals to effectively see through walls. You know, one of the requirements is to see through the walls, what is happening today. Of course, we have other techniques, RF, where you work on low frequencies to detect and so on. But that does not give the complete picture raising the possibility of flying drones using the technology to see inside the building. This is called X-ray vision, which will be able to see every square inch on the other side with high accuracy, figuring out where all the objects are, as well as their geometry and material type without any prior knowledge. Another thing that is happening is small nano drones, very small, like a, like a mosquito, like a, like a fly. Uh, 
the, these extremely small drones will be capable of surveillance without being detected. But there's a lot of advantage in this because the cost is that it will be average nano drone will cost about $25 per hour as against larger drones which are about $600 to $20,000 per hour. So we should develop, miniaturize the drones almost like a mosquito or a fly. Another technology which is emerging is all of us know that the GPS can be jammed. All of us know that the inertial navigation systems accumulate errors and hence accuracy gets affected. The flying insects and all, they don't have inertial navigation systems. They use what is called vision-based guidance. Hence a vision-based approach for guidance and safe landing of unmanned vehicles has been under discussion. Taking advantage from optical flow sensors acting like an insect's eye. Even this is becoming now a point of research. Some sensors have already come, what we call as the optic flow sensors are already in the market. So they are being used today, replacing GPS and other external signals when you run into problems. Solar power drones, it is not a new thing now. It is it's already coming in a big way. But what is important is the endurance and the altitude at which we can fly. In fact, there is a there is a there is a uh, work going on to have solar power drones to act provide the internet applications using instead of satellites one should be able to do it at 20000 feet or something or 60000 feet altitude providing the internet conditions for the suburban and areas where the normal internet you find it difficult to reach i also want to talk to you something about anti drone systems because drones are there Collectively, we are also building anti-drone system. Dr. Vidya Sagar probably will remember when we were doing the uh, IGMDP, Dr. Kalam started the program on anti-missile system. And I was made the program director for the ballistic missile design system. And we built um, uh, exo-atmospheric and anti-atmospheric missile defense system. So we, the, similarly, for the drones now, there is a requirement. So counter-drone technology, uh, to detect or intercept uh, the UAVs in the flight is required. It is rapidly emerging. It is not, not only technology, but it's a complete people and organization. Because when the drones are flying, they are flying for civilian applications, they are flying for a variety of applications. So organization, people, policy will also dictate how the counter drones will be used. AI and combat robotics are soon going to inhabit battlefields. So anti-drone units will become a template for future warfare. There's a need for effective uh, CUAS in terms of detect and interdict. Uh, some nations like Japan has already started using the Tokyo police. Uh, their purpose is not battlefield at the moment. What they're doing is the, the drones which are, which are not legal, how to capture them and put them behind. So what they're doing, they're using nets neutralized rogues. Taiwanese police have been testing RF jammers. Japanese are using nets and so on. The anti-drone technology is through geofencing. That means the areas which are not required to be enclosed, you do geofencing. Agreements with commercial drone manufacturers, a technique that will prevent UVs from flying near critical infrastructure by pre-programmed codes put in by manufacturers. Uh, India also has launched its uh, geofencing policy. Now, for the purpose of um, countering the drones, what are the detection technology? Because detection is more important. One is RF detection finding system, like typically we use in the case of radars. But the distance is a problem in this case. It can be only up to about three kilometers. Then radar detection system, again about three kilometers. Optical surveillance using either infrared or, or, or vision or daylight, then you can have about 1.2 kilometers. So, these are the sensors which are being planned to be used for counter defense. The neutralization technologies are also there. How many technologies? For example, non-destructive ones are you can hijack. You can jam the system and hijack the whole thing. Spoofing, wide availability includes autonomous and manual flight. Difficult to control. It is possibly nullified by manual control. Geofencing is another method. Another method is RF jamming. It is simple, effective for drones using unknown protocols. Uh, 
capture, as I mentioned to you, available for follow-up investigation like nets and all that, but difficult to target and hit possible damage during landing and crash. The destructive technologies are lasers. You can use laser beams to, after you have detected, you can fire a laser beam either from an aerial platform or a ground-based platform. DRDU has already developed a UAV uh, and a laser beam system now, which can take a UAV at a distance of, I think, two kilometers, if I'm not wrong. So that's being done today. Killer drones are also used, which can be uh, used, uh, go nearby and kill the other drone. And anti-aircraft weapons, as I mentioned to you, use a rocket or a missile as you do for anti-aircraft for doing this. So these are some of the neutralization methodologies. Like we did in the case of ballistic missile defense system, we had a layer defense system. We had exoatmospheric layer and we had an endoatmospheric layer. Similarly here, in the case of counter drone system, there's a layered architecture in which you have different kinds of sensors ground-based sensors, space-based sensors, communication network, and a kill unit, as it is shown here, and a central processing unit to find out whether it's a um, rogue or it is, a, it is an enemy or yours. Then you take, detect all of them. You can, even countermeasures are also being used using a jammer unit. So sensors, jammers, kill unit, Connected to a command control network is a full arc architecture for engaging the drones in the flight path. New drone concepts are jammers are now deployed to block the radio signal between drone and the operator. Uh, jammers are no protection against newer autonomous drones because there's no communication link there. Military high-powered lasers potentially offer a safer and more precise means of stopping drones. High power microwaves can stop a whole song, but their effectiveness falls off rapidly with range. There's a new radar which has been developed again in the West, which is called True View Radar, it is specifically designed for drone detection. Unlike traditional radar, which filters out slow moving objects, and its Sky Dome Manager provides full control, including defining any number of geofence danger zones. And uh, drone hunter interceptors, interceptors and uh, netted and towed away safety, as I mentioned in the case of uh, Japan. The system can coordinate multiple drone hunters against multiple threats. That is the advantage of this system. There is another thing which is emerging is, why not use an electromagnetic weapon uh, on the drone hunter to burn out electronics on multiple drones at the same time? Because one pulse can create a lot of havoc for the entire set of swarms. One big challenge now is that the detection range needs to be sufficient. Our problem is right now we are not able to detect such low RCS products using whatever methods. That's why those ranges are 3 kilometers, 1.2 kilometers and so on. So main problem is detection range sufficient to mitigate an attack before it becomes a two threat. That is where AI comes in and companies are trying their best to do a lot autonomously so that you won't even need a person sitting there thinking about it. Now, what India should do? We have to invest. Dr. Vijayasagar asked me what are we doing in AI. Now I'm saying what we have to do in the drones also. We need to invest more in counter US solutions. Needs to be drawn with investigating cutting edge technology for countering drones, indigenous R&D, support of government grants besides private investments. National counter drone guidelines have come. I don't know whether you have seen them, but they are actually uh, very clearly defining what are the critical areas in which you don't have to go. I made certain recommendations, which I'm sharing with you to MOD. Actually, this talk was given to a group of uh, generals, uh, a portion of this talk, not full. So that's why you have, MOD should conduct AI-focused war games to identify potential disruptive military innovations. Dr. Murthy, now this is the time. Under this umbrella, what you are saying, you should create a group here which will do AI-based bar games because the software algorithms that can be done beautifully here. You don't have to spend so much time on the build of the hardware. You have the computers, you have the boys and girls who can do the latest algorithms which are AI-based for war gaming. 
Then we should also have spending on areas that can provide sustainable advantage and mitigate key risks. We should have counter AI capabilities for both offensive and defensive, including cyber, we should bring in here. Of course, scientific organization should be given increased funding for AI. Dr. Vidya Sagar, see this. Scientific organization should be given increased funding for AI-related research. Should release a request for information for dual use of AI capability. I think this we should do in a big way. Government should provide additional resources to promote collaboration between national security community and commercial AI industry. Now what is happening is the armed forces have to come like they have come to IIT, they have to come to more commercial agencies which are also equally equipped now with the technology to synchronize and harness the capability. National Security Council, MOD and state should study where I have, what AI applications, if any, country should seek to restrict with treaties. This is another area. Like our NSA is there today sitting in America discussing various things. When we discuss with our friendly nations, we should discuss what AI applications we can share, we can track together. AI safety organization has to be created. We are talking about responsible AI, we were talking about explainable AI. So we have to create an AI safety organization. Fail safe and safety for performance technology for AI system that has to be created. Uh, we have to create systems for countering AI enabled forgery. As I mentioned to you, it's a double-edged weapon, so it can happen. So this is where we had to do the work. This is where there is a lot of scope for us to work in the case of AI-related UAV and unmanned operations. The sky is the limit because all AIs, all UAVs are in the air, sea, and the ground. So let us work together, work with the industry, work with the national laboratories, work with experts, and develop systems which will help our armed forces Rather than importing, we should have our own. Thank you very much. I'm open to questions if you have any. Any clarifications, questions, any? Yeah, please. Navy. Yeah. Application of AI ships. So that's uh, I would like to give a background to uh, people. Ships are very mobile. So they can go reach out to about 200 nautical miles, way, way away from the uh, coast. So it is difficult for the ships to communicate with any of the uh, infrastructure which is there available on land. So the major the part which we communicate is with SATCOM. But the problem with SATCOM is uh, one satellite uh, communication which we do with a particular satellite, but uh, the bandwidth is limited. So we do not, and the rest of the satellites which we have access to is not our own. Uh, so sensitive data it becomes a problem to be communicated. So with that background, sir, uh, I would like to know with respect to the uh, drone or with respect to any kind of AI technology which is to be implemented on board ships, the ships do not possess such kind of hardware and more, more importantly, do not have that much of space to implement that much of uh, that kind of hardware. So how should I, uh, like I've been reading research papers on distributed learning, federated learning in AI domain. Uh, so how should I make the best out of my time here? to focus on what applications should I focus on uh, to be implemented on those ships? You have yourself identified the problem. The problem is the lack of communication. And since communication is missing and you have only one SATCOM, which is also barely available with very limited bandwidth, the AI-based operations on the ship would require huge amount of data. And if the data is not communicated, as I showed you in that network from external environment, internal environment, and, and your battlefield environment, your AI applications will not run. So it becomes important that first you should reinforce your communication network. Now in today's context, 
there are various methods of doing it. Unfortunately, India has been slow in setting up a good satellite net cow network system of our own. After eight years of nine years of effort, you got your one satellite, what you are today talking of. Eight years, nine years it took with all great uh, efforts which have been made. But what we should do now, you should create a network of UAVs, unmanned aerial system, which can be launched by any ship from the ship deck and create a network which will have a land-based communication with a relay network system of communication, which will give you data from the environment into your ship on a continuous basis. Now that is where your federated approach of AI, the data transmission systems, all that what you are reading here can be applied. What I mentioned to you is the internet of things as we are talking of today, which is based upon uh, UAVs, a replica of that or a small segment of that can be created for as far as ships are concerned. They can also interact with your other sensors, like the radars you have on the ship many times, which are again used for detecting the aerial targets or the surface targets and things like that. They can be again integrated because the surveillance which can be done you using the UAVs with this data link what you have set in will be able to help you in the AI algorithms running on the ship. So ma machine interface with the combat systems using the combination a created uh, communication network should be the answer for you. And whatever you are learning here, federated systems and uh, cooperative uh, algorithm management, dynamic, uh, uh, you know, optimization of the algorithm to suit the situation, all that will be applicable there. Second one is more and more you should use the SGR technology in this. Don't use the conventional HFRF. What HFRF could be there, but SGR should be there. Cognitive is yet to come, but SDR is a major technology. The moment you will use SDR, you will have a great advantage of improving your jamming resistance because you can go for dynamic waveform shifting and also frequency hopping that will help you. And your bandwidth is going to be very high now uh, with the kind of uh, 5G and 6G networks which are talking of. Jamal question. Uh, so the new buzzword is ChatGPT, and there are talks that 50% of the universities will become irrelevant in the next couple of years or maybe five years time. So do you think it's high time for an institute like IIT Hyderabad to have course corrections? And if you think so, what should be the nature of that course corrections? See, copying was available from my days also in the examination, but it was stopped. It was not liked. It was a criminal activity. Similarly, if the knowledge test which you are going to go through is going to be assisted by the chat GPT, I think it should be treated as a criminal activity. It should not be promoted. So any student which is going to use for doing the uh, his own homework or whatever you call it, tutorial or your or project and bring a system from chat GPT, without actually understanding it, without actually. So there should be a mechanism created by the faculty to identify whether it is a uh, human driven system or an AI driven system, which is being presented to as a solution. I can tell you there are, there are very clear ways of uh, identifying whether it is a chat GPT system or it is done by a human brain. I'll give you an example of that. You, are, you must be doing translation using the algorithm from, say, English to Telugu or Hindi or whatever that language. That translation, if you read, I can make out by just one glance that this is a machine translation. This is not a translation which is done by, because the language, the way it comes out, is not the way the language is being either used for communication or used for writing. It is so pathetically, uh, and it does not have the necessary soul in it. When you write, there's a soul in that content. The chat GPT will not have that soul. So that is what you should be able to discriminate. As far as the legality is concerned, in my opinion, it should be banned. This is my opinion. I don't know what the others will feel. 
Sir, uh, again, uh, I'm a basically uh, electronic engineer. Uh, when you said Momo, uh, Mimo, I got nostalgic because I quoted in my MTech 2 international paper on it, thanks to my guide. Uh, so, but still, I have one thing I understood, and you asked for one picture. So, I have one question. My hobby is watching movie. So I don't have any technical, it is all observed uh, knowledge I have. Uh, we talked about all this going into the internet. You saw, talked about the cyber uh, space uh, as one of the pillars which we have to protect. So, it's a common uh, human or citizen of this country. Um, I have seen a lot of places the people are having a very high level of IQ because I'm seeing my son, the IQ which he has, I don't have even now, the kind of a grasping power. So, how, as I'm mean, asking, is it? As a government, I have this question as a common man, how we are ensuring that when this, all this crucial data is going to such network, we are able to protect, do, are we investing in those, as you talked about, the machine cannot take care of everything. So how we are ensuring that uh, we are safe? That is my question. You have raised the question of, I think, if I understood your question, is one of data privacy. Is that what you are saying? Kind of. See, data, data, data is important. All of us use the phrase data is oil and things like that. Now, data privacy laws are very important because while we need data for facilitation of all the processes which as a, as a society we want to follow, whether they are social change or a technological change or even legal system, we need data. Now, legal engines are there, you know that. We need data for that. But the problem is, if I want to say, for example, provide best health care, and I want to use your data, your health data, it will be in a repository, either in a hospital or in the national uh, health uh, repository network. Now, there is a policy provision that your data cannot be accessed without your permission. So like that, World over, people have made very stringent laws for data protection laws, DPR, they call it, DP, or I think something like that. And uh, if somebody is able to uh, do an unauthorized access, there are severe penalties for that. It is a severe penalty, $20,000 and things like that. European uh, uh, data protection laws are very strict. India is also coming up with the data privacy law because we are becoming a digitalized society today. And uh, we will use data in a big way for economic growth. But data privacy will have to be ensured. Now, uh, already there is a uh, NIC data network is there, where the complete statistical data which comes from different departments is cataloged. Now, even to access that, I have to have some permission. If I have to access, so all researchers, this, that, and all that, have to register themselves to the report to that data network thing and then they will be allowed to do that but if you're not registered that means your credentials have not been verified then you will not be able to access so like that some policy measures are being done so data privacy data protection laws are going to come in the, our country also worldwide it is already available selling the data also is becoming important for example for creating the maps Geological information, mining information, that our earth has got so much. Now, this information is needed by a foreigners. So, there is a methodology of selling the data. You can earn money you, by selling your data. You have done all the GPS survey or uh, sensor survey and geological surveys using satellites. You have spent money. Now, somebody wants whether tomorrow a oil company wants to know whether in the Bay of Bengal somewhere there is an oil possibility or not. It may be for India, but we will sell the data to him. Based on that, he will make a proposal to us. I hope I understood you. I was just actually doing my master's. Actually, there are uh, read about the protection law. So something has been uh, actually drafted by Indian government, which is in the I think so exact year. I'm not remember in the like 2006 or eight. Something has come. Maybe it has to be. Uh, my question was specifically for this military uh, thing. That when we all this data, which you're saying that everything will come to the 5G network. So will it be remain safe there that no hacker can take that data of our country? That was my yeah. The military networks are different. Military networks, if they want to use the commercial 5G network, they, they have protection systems. They, they, uh, for example, 4G is used today in the Northeast region and all that, but with a separate layer of protection. There is a lot of protection provided in that.
Good afternoon, sir. Uh, my son Pradesh. Uh, thank you for the informative uh, presentation. Sir, mine is then a uh, generic question actually. So, we are switching from uh, human inter intelligence to AI based intelligence for uh, war and uh, combat uh, vehicles and uh, drone systems, everything. So, what in the future of the human power in the military or the defense if AI is being like implemented so far? So, how will be the transition being seen? Because currently, uh, the, the, the combat vehicles have been uh, used by the human future can be it can be AI driven. So, what will be the future of human power, human resource in the military and defense if it's completely transition to AI? I think I, my talk was very clear. I showed you five pillars of human AI interface. You saw that now five pillars yes. where we talked of centaur, we talked of um, how the machine and the human will work, how the machine uh, alone will work. So human interface in an AI driven machine system or a weapon system will always be maintained. Now depends upon at what layer is maintained. For example, I gave you the for the example of that aircraft, which is launched, it goes, detects this, that, and all that. But before it fires or shoots a weapon, it gets a confirmation from the ground commander. And the ground commander is also running an AI-based uh, algorithm for decision making. So he synchronizes the tow uh, boat, takes the data in real time, which is coming. Probably his data, which he used, was not so current. So he also updates it and then gives him okay. So what is called, this is called cooperative system. And this cooperative system of AI based sensors and weapons with the command control system, which is again AI based, but manned by human brain will continue to be the future also. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. The combat will not have human beings directly fighting sword fights and all that. That, that what I can tell you. I am uh, Rakhinwanda Roy. I am a uh, naval officer. You asked already a question. Achha. Oh, sorry. So two, two Navy guys are working here. Yes, so many, eh? Hmm. Question, question. No problem. Yeah. Yeah. Sir, in uh, warfare, there is a concern called uh, first strike. Hand, dead hand in uh, Soviet era Russia, which has seismic sensors installed connected with nuclear weapons. When in the case of a uh, uh, eventuality, a nuclear attack happens on Russia, the seismic sensors will trigger a counter nuclear attack. Even though the whole population is wiped out, there is a chance that Russia will retaliate to a nuclear attack with nobody on ground. So this actually disturbed the world politics in a great way. Where deterrence itself triggered uh, military actions. Similar was the concept when applications of autonomous systems in warfare aren't we actually disturbing the power relation between nations and even if you're doing that uh, are we trying to do something like a second strike like a
unilateral intervention. That's why Air Force One and Russia's aircraft where the president the control as I mentioned to you will always remain with the human being, with the commander. He, you might be affected completely and if your entire population is gone, even in that case, Rahul sir, thank you very much, Commodore uh, Nambia. And uh, sir, yeah, I was for about 25 years in the Navy. So two small questions. Uh, one is a tactical question. You talked about uh, UAVs, but what is the uh, status of the UUVs, the underwater autonomous vehicles, uh, as far as DRDO is concerned? Because not not only military applications, 70% of the Earth is covered with water, whether it is you know the uh, minerals, the modules. Uh, the nodules that we have in the Indian Ocean. So that is one question. So second is, as far as the future of warfare is concerned, we we talked about this uh, Ukraine and Russia war. All my life, we were told that the armed forces are going to fight short and intense wars. You know, ten days, fifteen that, days. That that has become a myth now. That's become a myth now, because everybody said that six months, seven months, when the winter comes, this is going to die down. All this jealousy is out. Yes. So what is your future prognosis? When do you think this? Uh, Ukraine and Russia, what is likely to end? I don't want to give any prognosis on that or any prediction on that because it has much more larger uh, what is called political uh, equation. It is more a political equation rather than any because why you should go into the reason why the Russia Ukraine war is there. From there, you will find out. Russia Ukraine war came mainly because Russia did not want Ukraine to join NATO and America is the destabilizing factor in that because right when the split took place between of the USSR, the first thing they did was to capture the governance system of uh, Ukraine and it was being controlled by America, mainly because to control Russia in the proximity. This was the ill dimension of American thinking which has triggered this war. Now they want them to become part of the NATO. Russia does not want, because the moment NATO will come close to them, like it happened in the case of Poland, it will create problem. So this war is a political problem. It is not that Russia is interested in acquiring, uh, I mean, this is nothing like that. It is a problem which is triggered by America, the NATO. So when will it happen? What will happen will be a function of whether the two superpowers will understand that 
enough is enough now let us come to some kind of a uh, you know policy to stop it that kind it will not happen if 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 russia con america continues to support the ukraine with weapons and equipment and continues to bring them into nato i think this war will continue even for one more year I, that is my prediction the other question you asked about uuvs i think already uh, one csi or laboratory made a ua underwater uh, uh, unmanned vehicle which is for different purpose not for weapon and all drd also made one underwater with nstl or somebody has made it but i think the work is not of a nature which i can say has reached beyond trl 4 or 5 we need to do a lot of work on the underwater unmanned systems uh, and that is another area where i think uh, a lot of work is required to be done uh, both by the academicians as well as manufacturing agencies and navy particularly has to give it a major push because if you don't uh, do this there are civilian applications of underwater systems particularly now we are looking for uh, these uh, seabed mining operations we need huge systems china has already gone to 6000 meters they have pressure vessels which are operating at 6000 meters today so if you really want to control the economic assets which are there in your region, like the manganese oxide and the lead and sulfides and all that, I think we have to have unmanned vehicles as much as possible. Second thing is the surveillance which is there now of the internet. The Russians used to do earlier uh, that all the cables which are there on the seabed, they were being sensed to find out the communication. You know the Russians did it uh, for between uh, during the Cold War era. We need to do that today also. Because if you, not only what is there in the air, what is there in the cable, I should be able to do it and only I can do it using the UVs. So we have to do a lot more work on it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Indeed, it was a very insightful talk for all of us. Thank you. So now I would request Professor Murthy to, to present a memento. Uh, to Dr. Sarshwat as a token of our appreciation and gratitude. So you can join us. Let me join the Yes. Uh, yes. Uh. Uh, to conclude this event, I would request Professor Kirti Chandra Shahu to deliver a vote of thanks. So much of great things happening in the campus. I would request Professor Kirti Chandra Shahu to uh, felicitate our uh, chief guest and uh, with a small gift. To all of you. One more. Yes. <laughs> this is from us. Sir. <laughs> you won't leave. <laughs> oh, thank you. So much. <laughs> this is from our group. Oh, okay. Thank, thank you. you. Some brain drops inside. <laughs> 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 I would request to deliver a whole photo. Thanks. You can do it. So, thank you, Dr. Gupta. Uh, I am honored by this opportunity. Good, 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 good afternoon, everybody. We are very grateful to Dr. Uh, B.K. Saraswat, sir, Honorable Niti Aayog Member, Government of India, for sparing his valuable time from his busiest schedule to visit IIT Hyderabad and delivering this talk. Your thoughts have really enlightened us, sir, and guided us to move forward in a, the emerging path. I thank our director, Professor Murthy, sir, uh, for his kind support and encouragement always. I am also grateful to uh, Professor Vidyasagar, sir, uh, for uh, gracing this event with his presence. It's an honor for us, sir. Last but not the least, I would like to thank all of you uh, for your encouragement, support, and uh, be a part of this event. I'm, 
uh, your presence, supports, and contributions have really made this uh, a memorable day today. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I have, uh, uh, I mean, it has been already uh, announced. Uh, we have another uh, events coming up to inaugurate the uh, research render of research facility in the RCC building. We cordially invite you all to participate in that event. So before we conclude, yes, something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, they can come there. They can come there and see. Okay, okay, sir. Sure. Uh, video? Yes, we have a small teaser. After the talk, kindly put, put, put that thing in the bags and. Okay, so. Well, there are more, there are bags. Yeah. What do you Uh, now it's time to release a teaser of our raindrop research facility proposed by our uh, prepared by our uh, PRO of Ms. Metalia Grival. Let's have a sneak peek of what's to come and beyond, and ra uh, a raindrop facility first of its kind in uh, in India. Without a without further ado, let's have a look. Professor Kirti Chandra Saho is a faculty of chemical engineering department at IIT Hyderabad, who is one of the stars in the country working in the area of raindrop dynamics. After a lot of uh, research, Professor uh, Saho is able to set up first of its kind experimental facility at IIT Hyderabad, which can predict the raindrop dynamics at various altitudes. This particular facility is expected to uh, provide a lot of information on weather forecasting, particularly the rainfall. Accurate rainfall prediction is one of the grand challenges in environmental research due to its relevance in understanding climate change and its accompanying socioeconomic impact. However, it is far from perfect. One of the key limitations in rainfall modeling is the lack of fundamental understanding of the microphysical processes such as coalescence, breakout, and phase change in the actual environmental conditions. When the rainfall starts to fall from the cloud to the ground, the temperature is below zero degree centigrade and humidity is super saturated in the cloud. As the fall, the temperature increases and humidity decreases, which largely influences the rainfall dynamics by altering the associated microphysical processes. There are other effects such as air current, aerosol chemistry. Those effects also can influence the raindrop dynamics. Rather than migrating the raindrop from the cloud to the ground, we render the raindrop stationary in the test section by regulating the air from the in the upward direction and conditioning the inlet air in such a way that the suspended droplets in the test section experience the local and atmospheric condition as if the droplet raindrops are falling from the cloud to the ground. In our novel experimental facility, the temperature can be varied from minus 10 degrees centigrade to 40 degrees centigrade, and the relative humidity can be changed from 0 to close to 100 percent. Thereby, we can mimic the dynamic atmospheric condition from the cloud to the ground, and then uh, using this facility, we can get the same and size distribution of the raindrops at different altitudes. This information will be used to improve rainfall prediction. Now, um, it is not only going to be useful for the country, but also to the whole world, uh, predicting the rainfall in a much better fashion than what is available at this moment. I'm sure that uh, the whole community in this field can get benefited.
The event has now concluded.